Today, we are going to go over copywriting. So what copywriting is, for anybody who hasn't who doesn't know that term, is it just means writing for persuasion, writing for the sake of trying to get somebody to do some, something. So that could be trying to get somebody to click on an ad. It could be getting somebody to watch a video. It could be getting people, somebody to call you or to book a sales or book a, a call to speak with you. It could be to get somebody to buy your product, right? Those are all examples of copywriting. It's writing for persuasion. So there, when it comes to making money, essentially, there's two, like, not exactly making money, but when it comes to getting customers, there's two, like two big skills. There is copywriting, and there is sales. Now, these are very similar, right? Copywriting is writing for persuasion, and sales is essentially speaking to someone in a way to persuade them to do something. The difference here is that Copywriting is premeditated, right? You have, you can spend as long as you want, generally, writing an email or writing a video script. Whereas sales, if you're talking to somebody face to face, well, now you don't have that luxury, right? You have to be able to say the right things on the spot. So I've, I, I mean, for me, the copywriting comes a lot easier because I think a little bit. I guess I think slowly. <laughs> so it helps if I have that that premeditation, if I can come up with it in advance. And also a, a lot of stuff that might seem like sales or it might seem like it's coming off the top of someone's head for a lot of people, a lot of skilled marketers, it's not. It's actually it's actually copywriting. So if you watch a lot of my YouTube videos, for example, a lot of those are scripted out in advance. I try to give the impression that I'm just spouting it off the top of my head, but a lot of times I'm not, right? And so copywriting is super valuable because, but why? Copywriting is super valuable because it is the basis of a lot of different content, a lot of different marketing and sales content. So ads right if you run facebook ads you have to write out the words in the ads if you run video ads like i do on youtube i always write a script that i'm is what i'm going to say in the ad right i'm not just riffing that off the top of my head and i recommend that you don't especially if you're going to actually pay money for an ad to run then you you plan it out and, and plan every word as well as you possibly can for maximum effect um so Sales letters, right? Or sales pages on the internet, emails. If you want to send emails to somebody like I do that try to prove a point, try to get somebody to think in a certain way, try to get somebody to book a call with you, try to get somebody to buy your product, et cetera. It's, that's all copywriting. And then um, like organic content. So organic like videos, social media posts. Again, it's all copywriting. So if you know this one skill of copywriting, then you'll that's like the basis, that's the foundation to be successful in a whole bunch of other related skills that are all very profitable and, and make a lot of money. So, okay, so that's kind of why copywriting is important. So let's get into some principles. Now, I should warn you that this is an introduction, that copywriting is a huge subject. There's a lot of a lot of material on it. And so I'm obviously not going to give it all to you tonight. So I'm just going to focus on one principle of copywriting, which is ease of understanding. Right? Whenever you write for the sake of persuasion, whenever you write copy, and by the way, copy is the thing that you write right if you're if you're writing a sales letter the words that you write are called copy so you're writing copy copywriting just in case i wasn't clear so principle 1 is ease of understanding when you want to write copy that is that works that's effective in persuading people you want them to be able to understand you 
And so this is the opposite of academic writing, right? And this is the opposite of your college textbooks. You want, you're not trying to impress people, right? If your idea when writing copy is that you want to impress people by how smart you are and how big your vocabulary is, then you are shooting yourself in the foot and your copy is not going to work at all. So um, let me give you some specific strategies for increasing the ease of understanding in your copy. And by the way, you hear I'm I'm teaching this. I'm I'm not exactly using good copy language. I'm I'm using some big words and stuff. So this is not copy. I it when I I'm going to show you the principle here. I'm going to show you the strategies and then afterwards I'm going to give you an example of an actual piece of copy and I'm going to point out all of these things. So first thing is conversational language. So what you want is when somebody reads your, when you write something, you're using the same words that you would use if you were speaking to somebody, right? So it's it makes it easy for the person to understand, easy for the person to accept. It doesn't take effort, which by the way, the whole point of all of this is that you are saving the person mental energy. When you have to, if you think about when you read like a college textbook or you read something that's very, very difficult reading material, it's like, it's almost hurts your brain. It's not comfortable to read. And it's, scientists have shown actually that it, that a more difficult material burns blood sugar. So it's actually burning more calories. So from a survival standpoint, you are, it's very inefficient to read something that's difficult. Even if you can, even if you are a highly intelligent person and you can read the thing, then um, you still don't want to, right? Because you want to conserve your resources. You want to conserve your blood sugar, right? It's, it's a natural evolutionary instinct that we all have. So conversational language is the first thing. The, the big hack to doing this is just say the thing that you're going to write, then write it. And then once you've written it, then, then read it as though you were talking in a normal conversation. And if it feels natural to you to say it, then that's a good sign. If it does not feel natural, then you want to rewrite it in a way that does feel natural. The more conversational it feels, the easier it is going to be for the person to read and the easier for them to understand. So that's point number one. The second one is short paragraphs. So... Do you know the feeling when you open up an email or you open up a book? And it, this is my favorite example, actually. Like I, I open up a book and I'm I flip a page, and then the next page is the whole page is one paragraph. And it's not even the complete paragraph. It's like the first half of the paragraph takes up an entire page. Right. You, you kind of, at least for me, I kind of like mentally groan when I see that. I'm like, please, like break this up for me. So the opposite of that is to use very short paragraphs. And in fact, I generally, if you've noticed in my copy material, like my emails, I generally will put one sentence per paragraph and sometimes not even a full sentence. Sometimes I'll break up one sentence into two paragraphs. Right, I'm dividing it up into tiny little bite-sized chunks because it makes the it makes it easier to consume. Right, it's not so intimidating like the giant block of text that you're like you see that and you kind of groan. You're like, oh well, yeah, maybe I'll read that later. So short paragraphs that helps a lot. Short, simple sentences. So if you remember back to grammar class when you learned about independent and dependent clauses and prepositional phrases and all that, like the more of those fancy grammar things that you include a sentence in a sentence, the more difficult it is to understand the sentence and the more you're going to just get people to leave. 
Another thing to consider here too is a lot of times when you're writing copy, you're writing to a person that's not quite, that's on the fence about whether or not they even want to read it in the first place, right? Like if I'm writing an email to somebody that, that doesn't know who I am and doesn't really, isn't invested in me in any way, probably I catch their attention with the headline and then they start reading with the the intention that, oh, I'm going to, I'm, I'll just see what this is about. And if it's boring, then I'll stop reading it. Right. So the people are not committed to this. So I want to make it as easy as possible for them to continue reading, to continue down the page. And so short, simple sentences with not a lot of commas and semicolons. And uh, I mean, the dividers are good, but I mean, if there's multiple parts to the sentence, if it's a complex sentence, then that's generally a bad thing. So, and by the way, if you do have that, if you find that you're running, writing long, complex sentences, just, just separate them into multiple sentences. That's fairly easy to do. I'll show you an example of that in just a minute here. Next thing is simple vocabulary, right? In fact, here's an, here's an example, small words. Simple vocabulary is saying the word simple vocabulary, I'm breaking my own rule, right? Small words is a much better way to say it. It's it's saying the same thing essentially, but in a way that's that's easy to understand. Um, it's like if you have a choice of saying some some big word that would give you get you a lot of money if you're or get you a lot of points if you're playing Scrabble refrain from the urge to do that and, and and you know i i even have to like i have to catch myself like i just said the word refrain i, I wouldn't say, refrain from the urge to do that i would not write refrain from the urge to do that i would write don't do that i'm trying to make it as simple as possible while keeping the same meaning and i almost said retain the same meaning but then i i corrected myself in my head and i said keeping the same meaning so um, this and this, so again, it goes back to economizing brain power, right? Or here I go again, economizing. I've gotten used to using big words in my normal sentences. So I have to break myself of that habit. Um, although I'm, I'm good at that with writing, but when I'm talking, I still talk that way. Uh, so you, people, people, will understand you better, as I said, if you if you make it easy for them. And it, that includes intelligent people. And a lot of people don't understand this. They think, oh, if I want to attract intelligent people, then I should use big words. No, it doesn't work that way. It's like people want to do as little work as possible. And reading a big block of text with a lot of a lot of big words, that's work, even for a highly intelligent person. I think it's interesting that, um, well, the, the kind of the, the rule of thumb here is to use a fifth grade level or below, right? You want, if it's a fifth grade level, like according to fifth grade in schools, then, then that's good. If you can get it to a, a fourth grade or a third grade, then even better. And I remember when I learned that, um, for the first time, it was actually during the 2016 election cycle. And I had seen so many news articles criticizing Donald Trump because they they determined that he spoke at a fifth grade level. And I thought that was so funny because Trump has, has made an art of this. He has mastered this. He is, his normal way of speaking is copywriting. Right. It, like it's it's co and copywriting translates to speaking. If you want to convince people of something, as you have to do, if you're a politician, then you want to make it as easy as possible for them to listen to you. Now, there's a really excellent app that's free for that that will actually rate your writing. It's called the Hemingway app. It's HemingwayApp.com. And what it does, if I can get my face out of the way, is you 
you just paste in some text here and then it will tell you what reading level your your or what grade level your text is and so this is it's rating this sample text already and it's saying okay this is a grade four grade four is good and then it will also it's highlighting this sentence because it says one of these sentences is hard to read so if we look at that sentence or let, let's look at the whole thing here for a second i know it's hard to believe that you can lose 30 pounds in 30 days very easy, very simple language. That one's good. If you told me that five, if you told me that five years ago, I would have said you were crazy. Also very good. And then, but then I learned about the neuroendocrine system and how you can change your biological set point. Okay, now you're introducing a bunch of big words that people that take some effort for people to understand. So that's why that gets highlighted in yellow. You want to. You want to shorten that in some way. And you don't have, I mean, just explaining science is not a bad thing. You just have to do it in a way that's as simple as possible. So we could say, but then I learned about the neural endocrine system. And then I would say like, which is this amazing uh, system your body has that does I don't know. I don't know what the neuroendocrine system is, but see how I've just I've just taken. OK, there's a difficult concept and I've broken it down into something a little bit easier. And I might even say give an analogy. It's almost like if you had a in your car, you have the car's computer that tells the car when to go and when to stop. Right. Using an analogy to make it simpler. And so, and then you'd have to change this second too. Um, and you could say, and because of this, you can, let's say you can actually change your biological set point. And then, which is, you know, whatever the biological set point is, right? You see how that's a lot easier to read, especially for somebody that doesn't understand the science. Okay, so that's um, that's the simple vocabulary. And then explain complex topics simply. And I, I jumped the gun a little bit because that's kind of the example that I just gave you. But the idea is that sometimes you're going to have to explain something that's complicated. For example, let's say that you want to sell a weight loss product, which, well, actually, that's the example that we're using. If you want to sell a weight loss product that has some method, some science behind how it functions, you want to explain that science to show that, the, I mean, the science itself gives, gives it credibility, right? The fact that there's a method gives it credibility. And if you can explain that in a way that makes sense, but at the same time is easy to understand, then that's very convincing, right? People will, will be much more likely to buy if they know that there's a method they understand the method and they believe that the method makes sense. So there's a few ways to do this. There's a few ways to explain complex topics simply. One is visuals. If you can have a diagram of something or you have like Dr. Oz is really, really good at this. If you ever watch the Dr. Oz show, he's a, a like celebrity doctor that has his own TV show where he explains health topics. And so he'll have he'll have all these kind of like props. So he'll have like a, a bowl of M and M's, for example. And he say the each of these M and M's is like your one of your brain cells. And then he'll put some like pour some maple syrup on it and say, well, when whatever hormone comes into your body, it's like maple syrup covering your brain cells and making them sticky. I, I made that up off the top of my head, but it's you, you're coming up with a, an image 
that can be an image that's something that you're actually showing a prop, or it could be just a drawing or a diagram. So visuals are helpful. Another thing that's very helpful are, are analogies, right? So you say your, your neuroendocrine system is doing X, Y, Z. It's kind of like when you get in your car and you turn the key and the car takes a long time to start because the gas is cold, right? So you relate it, you relate the complex thing that they don't yet understand to something that they do understand that's simpler. Stories are another great way to explain it. I had an email recently where I told a story about I got a blood draw and the the lady that that drew my blood forced the needle in through both sides of the vein and it created this like massive ball of blood on my arm and it, it didn't it took like two weeks for it to heal and the well at the same time and this is a true story by the way at the same time there was a guy the other guy that was working at the same lab was doing the same like doing a blood draw on this this terrified little girl who's probably like four years old and she was screaming and crying and she has you know his tiny little arms with these tiny little girl veins and and i'm i have like big man veins and she didn't have any problem at all the guy working on her did just fine but the lady that was doing mine uh, did a terrible job, even though my, for me, it should have been a lot easier. Um, and so I use that as a story to illustrate the point of people think of this idea of, of equality, that people get equal pay for equal work. But in reality, there's no such thing as equal work. Even if people have exactly the same job, some people can do a 10 times better job of it than other people. So if you can have a find a story, and it could be a story that happened to you, it could be a story that happened to somebody else, it could even be a parable, right? I mean, Jesus's parables are the perfect illustration of this. If it's something that's difficult, and I mean, a lot of religious spiritual stuff is very difficult to understand. And so stories will help you, it will help people to get a grasp of that. So stories are a great way to do it. And then Another way is examples, right? So let's say that you have, that you want to show how a, a reverse mortgage works, for example. So, and here I am giving an example of giving an example. It's kind of meta. So if you can give an example of the point that you're trying to prove. So you could say, okay, well, if you have a home that's worth $400,000, and you've already and you have a mortgage that you've paid off to that's worth two hundred thousand dollars, and you want to get five thousand dollars per month in in um, withdrawing, then you do all the math for them. You like write it out and say you could go for twenty years just doing this before the value of your house is depleted. So what you're doing is you. this is a complex topic. If you're talking about a, a financial instrument, it's a little bit difficult to wrap your head around. But if you actually give them a specific example with specific numbers and you walk them through the numbers one at a time, then all of a sudden it's a lot easier to understand, right? And so having somebody understand it and understand the mechanism behind it is much better than just saying, hey, it works, trust me. Okay, so that's that's it. Those are like the main things that I want to go over today. There's probably more that you could think of, but this principle ease of understanding is super important. And these are kind of the, the five biggest points under that. And so I want to show you an example of some of this. So if I can get this Zoom window to stop blocking my browser. Come on, there we go. Okay, so here is an email that I sent out recently that I wanted to show you. So this was, this yeah, I just sent out a couple of days ago for a sale that was going on. It's not going on anymore. Um, so notice first thing, and actually let's go through 
one point at a time. So first of all, conversational language. So first line, if you're interested in YouTube ads, ads mastery, the grand opening sale ends in just four hours. Here's the info in case you missed it. My brand new program, YouTube Ads Mastery, is finished and ready for sale. So you hear me speaking this, and it's very natural for me to speak this. I wrote this in the same way that I would speak. I didn't write in an academic way. And then I also, just to kind of a personal preference of mine, I like to capitalize words that I would emphasize. So I'm saying here, my brand new program, YouTube Ads Mastery, is finished and ready for sale. I've spent the last two and a half months building out this program so that includes everything that you need to run a highly profitable YouTube ads, run highly profitable YouTube ads. So you see, you, you don't have to do that. It's just a personal preference of mine, but I think it's it, it adds to the conversational flavor of it. So next point is the short paragraphs. So you see one sentence. One sentence, one sentence. Like each paragraph is just one sentence. And in fact, if you look at this paragraph or these two paragraphs, this is really one sentence that I, I separated into two paragraphs because it was a long sentence. So look at this. I've spent the last two and a half months building out this program so that includes everything you need to run highly profitable YouTube ads whether you run them for your own business or get paid them to run them for other people's businesses. And notice that you, if you were writing this for your English teacher, the English teacher would, would like give you a big red X through this because this is not a sentence. This is the second half of a sentence. So if I was using proper grammar or English teacher approved grammar, I would say, YouTube ads, comma, whether you run them for your own business or get paid to run them for other people's businesses, period, right? That would be proper grammar, but then I have a long, complex sentence and a long paragraph, and so I broke it up. So here, here's your permission. You're allowed to break the rules of normal English to make your copy more persuasive, and, and pretty much everybody that's good at copy does break the rules of proper grammar sometimes. And the next part is short, simple sentences. So same thing, right? This was one sentence, but I broke it up into two to make it short and simple. If I if I had YouTube ads, comma, whether you run them for your business or get them paid, like you'd have a very long sentence, it's a four line sentence. And then, and breaking things up in general is very helpful, by the way. And so you can see kind of how I do that a little bit here. So it's not only that I'm breaking up sentences or that I'm, that I'm doing the short paragraphs, but here I have like the little dash thing that breaks it up. Now here I go into bullet points, which are also bold. That breaks it up. It's introducing a little bit of variety here. It makes it easier to go down the page. And then I have, you know, I have a link here. Um, so this is fairly well broken up. This is not... If you would imagine if I wrote this whole email as just one big paragraph, it would be much more difficult to read. It would be exactly exactly the same words. It would be the same material, but it would be much more difficult to read. And then um, the simple vocabulary. So I could, let me actually just put this in the Hemingway app and we'll see what Hemingway thinks about it. Okay, so Hemingway gives it a grade four. Cool, I'm good with that. And then, oh, even though I broke up this sentence, it still thinks that this is too difficult. <laughs> and you can, I mean, you don't have to make, like get zero across the board on these. It's just a guide. You wanna, sometimes there's a trade-off between being easy to understand and being actually what you want to express. And then, okay, so it really doesn't like this sentence. It says, very hard to read. I'm also including a one-on-one -on -one kickoff call where we'll sit down together and put together a strategy that's customized for your goals specifically. So if I wanted to improve that, I could say, I'm also going to include a one-on-one -on -one kickoff call. New sentence. Um, let's say, in this call, we'll sit down together and put together a strategy 
and okay still doesn't like it it's it's better now it's a it's gotten from very hard to read to just hard to read for your goals specifically so how would we i think i would just leave it i mean i think i'm okay with this maybe i could say instead of put together i could say create strategy that's Oh, what if I say what well, that's specific to your goals? There we go. Now it likes it. Anyway, you get the idea. So, right, simple vocabulary. And, and this will, if I'm using big words that are not helpful, it'll highlight it in purple. So let's think about... What if I say, instead of sit down together, what if I say we'll corroborate on the strategy? Um, huh, didn't, didn't mark it. But I would still, in this, this app is not perfect by any means. It's just a rough guide. But I wouldn't, I like, I like we'll sit down together is a heck of a lot better than we'll corroborate because of the simple language. And then... Explaining complex topics simply. I don't have any complex topics in this particular email, so it's not a good example here. But um, that's something you can definitely look out for when you're looking at sales pages or you're looking at ads. If you see, you can see, I see this in YouTube ads a lot, especially something that's related to science or something that's related to finance, that they're complex topics, so they have to find some way to explain them in a way that people understand easily. So, okay, so that's it. Um, look at my notes here. Yeah, so that's that's it for this lesson. Oh, and, and actually I have, I have a really bad example. If you wanna see an embarrassing mistake that I made, I can't really show you here, but if you look at some of the emails that I've sent for the same ad campaign, if you've been getting these emails about YouTube Ads Mastery, there's, it's not this one, but if you go to the one before it, if you click on the link, it'll take you to a Google Doc. And that Google Doc looks good on a computer, but I just tried looking at it on a phone for the first time today, and I notice it's awful. <laughs> on the phone, it's like small letters and big blocks of text, big paragraphs. And I'm like, oh, I, I really shot myself in the foot with that one because... Nowadays, most people on the internet are accessing from their phones. And so you, whenever you're creating something, more often than not, you're going to be creating from a computer. But the people that are actually reading it or the people that are actually watching it, more often than not, are watching on a phone. So you always got to be careful of that. You always want to optimize for the mobile experience because that's where most people are going to be. And so I completely forgot to do that. I wrote it on my computer. I thought it looked good on my computer. I sent it out. I didn't realize how atrociously bad it looked on a phone. So um, it goes to show you that you could, no matter how much experience you have, you're always going to make some mistakes and there's always ways to improve. So that's it for today. And, um, and I, Imran, I see your comment. Can you please show for a moment the previous example? Which which example were you referring to? Looks like you said that a few minutes ago. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Um, sorry. Yes, sir, I hear you. Yeah, so actually um, I, was, I was referring to that example in which you use a medical terminology, and that was probably your second example in the, in the session. Um, it was... It was a second section, second example, and it was, uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, Chris. So it was, it was supporting um, one of your, uh, one of your, you know, um, I think uh, when you said uh, you don't use uh, jargons or difficult terminologies in that one. Oh, okay. So was it the the one about the neuroendocrine system? I think so. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I, I like that example, If but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't read it properly. So if you could. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, that was just the default that they gave me on the Hemingway app here. Let me see if I can open it again and it'll do it. Mm. Maybe if I undo a bunch of times, I don't know. No, I... I don't, it was just an example that came up as soon as I pulled up the app. I don't know why it's not working now. Let me let's try with another browser. If uh, I also have a question uh, after you are finished with this one. Okay. Yeah, it's I can't find that again. That was just the example that came up. No issues. No issues, uh, Chris. I also wanted to know, Chris, that if we want to. Uh, brush up this uh, skill, which is very important skill, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why we're attending this. Uh, what are the other, uh, you know, resources available to uh, get our hands on, and, you know, to just to brush up this skill? Yeah, good question. So there's, let's see, I'll, I'll write some down. So there's a book called Great Leads by, I think, a guy named Michael Masterson. I may be getting the author wrong. It's something Masterson. That's a really good one. And then um, there's another one that I really liked too. I can't remember the name. It's, it's the, the author is Kyle Milligan. I don't remember the name though. Let me see. Okay. Kyle Milligan book. Does it take their money? Yeah, maybe that was it. Kyle Milligan. Yeah, Kyle Milligan. That's right. I could see that name. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So take, I think it's take their money. Take mm -hmm. their money. So those are a great place to get started. I like those a lot. And a lot of uh, something else too that's really really helpful is just look at it written copy and especially like pr promotional emails are probably the easiest way to see this or if you look at sales pages. Okay. You can look at you can watch videos and oh and ads too like Facebook ads. It's best to learn copywriting in my opinion or to analyze copywriting in actual written form because okay. Videos are all copywriting too, but the problem is that you can't sit there and stare at one sentence. You play the right. video and the sentence goes by. Um, whereas like Facebook ads, if you see like a long Facebook ad, that's a good one to study to, to just kind of look at the, the devices that they're using and say, hmm, it's interesting that they explained this in this way, or it's interesting that they put an emoji after every line, that kind of thing. Because right, right. that is premeditated, like that's all, it's all intentional. Right, right. So what you mean is that there is a lot of creativity that one can, of course, uh, bring in, but you have to then balance it with the uh, situation and the context of it and see this whether this uh, situation really uh, warrants this uh, kind of creativity or not, like using a lot of emojis is not uh, station, um, you know. So and and yeah, like and, yeah, and it depends on the audience too. Like yeah, exactly. Some audiences like a lot of emojis. Some audiences think that you're an idiot if you use a lot of emojis. So yeah, that's no, know your audience. That's true. that's true, absolutely. Although emojis are kind of uh, uh, close the gap and uh, make it a little informal. And you know, if the situation is a little tensed up, you will use an emoji, and then everybody feel comfortable about it. So that way, it is quite useful sometimes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great session. Cool. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Oh, and I did have, uh, before I forgot, I, I have a, a little homework assignment for you guys, which mm -hmm. as usual, nobody's required, but it's it's always very, very helpful if you actually practice this and don't just listen to it because mm -hmm. research shows that you only remember like well, five to 10% of what you listen to but if you actually put it into practice right away, you you remember a heck of a lot more. So 
the e the homework is write an email promoting your product. Now, you don't have to send the email. You don't even have to write it in an email editor. You can just write it in a, a Word document, but write a, a format, like a formatted email, say, hi, name, comma, and then promote whatever it is that you sell. If you don't sell anything, then promote something that you'd like to sell. And if you can't think of what you'd like to sell, then promote something that just any product that you know of, right? Promote the the brand of television that you that you have in your living room. Like it doesn't matter. Just practice on something, and try to practice with writing in such a way as that you are covering all of these five points. And then once you write it, then go back and analyze it according to these five points. Look at it and say, is my language conversational? If I read this speaking it, does it feel natural to speak? How long are my paragraphs? How long are my sentences, right? Go back after you write it and then analyze based on the same criteria. Right, right. There's something very interesting which I have observed as a as a as a skill in copywriting. Can I can I just uh, is it out of place to mention it over here or is it uh, okay to? Not at all. Go for it. Okay. So I uh, I have come from a banking background, you know, commercial banking, finance, uh, you know, as a financial planner and before that commercial banker. So okay. in my profession, um, uh, when people write this very academic and very serious. Uh, you know, that's, but then I moved from commercial banking to uh, personal finance and, you know, wealth management, where you have to use um, a lot of informal language and you have to, you have to build up the trust and you have to gain the relationship kind of uh, with individuals. So my writing, I am trying to make an effort to, you know, change my writing. So sometimes it becomes a hardcore and you are used to writing very academic and very serious kind of a tone. And then it's quite an effort to really change it, uh, you know, to the one which is uh, not very serious. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. It's it's something that you get used to over time. It's not something that you, you, that you get right away most of the time. I mean, maybe there's some people that were just kind of born that way, that that's normally the way that they talk and the way that they think. But I think probably most people that learn this, they're kind of, over-analyzer people like me. <laughs> <laughs> and Julian said, Cash for Tizing by Roger Dawson. Is that another book on copy? I haven't heard of it before. But there, there's a lot of great books on there out there. There's, there's a bunch of great courses. It's one you can get as a free download. It's, uh, it's <clears throat> just goes into the psychology of copywriting and advertising. I think oh. it's really, really, really powerful. Very cool. Yeah, I don't know that one, but I, I don't doubt it. Well, that's all I got for tonight, everybody. So I hope that was helpful. And uh, as usual, um, we'll be here, same time, same place, 6.30 p.m. Eastern, dominatethemarket.net slash rainmakers. Thanks for joining, everybody, and I'll see you all next week.